Greetings to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As the saying goes, my friend, it takes twice the effort for the wicked to earn hell than it does for the godly to gain heaven. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? C.S. Lewis thought so. He said something similar, which I paraphrased on one of St. Mark's signs back in October, I think. You can only get to hell on your own, is what I said making use of the space we had available on the sign, but that's what Lewis was getting at. Both sayings, both of them, call to mind the law and the gospel. Lewis's wisdom points out that the free gift of Christ is for the whole world, as John 3.16 says, right? The person who goes to hell goes there because he rejects Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of his sins. He goes there after working at it. The gift of justification by grace alone is given to all. Jesus died for the love of the world, but some reject his gift. And this relates to the first saying, the wicked earn hell. They have to work at it, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hell is earned, dear saints. Heaven is given. This reality is witnessed in baptism. Joe, McCole, and baby John were given a free gift this morning in their baptisms. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to do a single thing to get the gift of heaven. In fact, it wouldn't be a gift if we did. If you had to earn heaven, it wouldn't be called gift. We wouldn't have gospel. We wouldn't have grace. It would be labor. It would be salary. God is abundantly gracious. He forgives, not because we've earned it, precisely because we can't earn it. Jesus did all the earning that is necessary. He was incarnate in the human flesh, our human flesh. He dwelt among us. He lived like you live for you because yes, someone, someone indeed has to do the earning. Someone has to earn the thing in order to give the thing. The thing doesn't just appear. Someone has to earn it. And Jesus did all the work of keeping God's good and holy law so that he could give what he earned to you. What he earned is your forgiveness of sin. What he earned is eternal life that he gives to you. And this is why the saying rings true, even if the math doesn't quite work out. It takes twice the effort for the wicked to earn hell than for the godly to gain heaven. Because we don't have to put in any work. But the wicked are very industrious in their sin, aren't they? The unrepentant sinner is working hard at all the sins he wants to commit. And this is what we need to grasp. If we are to truly understand our Lord's parable of the dishonest manager. It's a confusing parable, at least at first, because it seems weird that Jesus would praise dishonesty. That that Jesus would would praise sin, just doesn't seem to compute. And all of a sudden we're reading this text and we're hearing the parable and we're just like, this doesn't make sense to me. The parable isn't about Jesus praising sin. Of course he doesn't do that. The parable is all about the contrast between those who work for something and those who don't. And Luther got right to the point when he preached on this text. He said, it's similar to a story with a lewd woman who in order to get on with her harlotry, her prostitution, grooms herself very beautifully. And the gold, the velvet, the silk, (laughs) in Luther's day, are not to be blamed because she's using these things for unchaste purposes. It's not the, the accoutrement that is to blame. No. And Luther says, I can exhort you, Christian, in the same way, relative to her tactics. You see, don't you, how that woman prepares herself for harlotry, Luther says. So why don't you, as a Christian, use the same diligence in order to please your bridegroom, our dear Lord Christ? I mean, the prostitute is putting all this work into preparing herself for some John, 
Why aren't we, the bride of Christ, putting in this kind of work to prepare ourselves for the bridegroom? When I say this, Luther says, I'm not approving adultery, but the effort, the concern, and the foresight which we ought to employ in honorable, good, and divine matters. This is what Jesus says. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Luke 16, 8. You, dear Christian, are the sons of light. We are. As we heard in the In the baptisms this morning, according to the baptismal rite, on page 268 in the hymnal, we have received the light of Christ. Yeah? Yes, we heard it. We've seen it. We saw the the candle being passed as a symbol of the light that is received in the heart. And so we have to ask ourselves, what exactly are we considering this morning with this gospel text? This, This dishonest manager, what is the point of this for us? And this is straight up third use of the law territory, isn't it? The law as a guide for Christians. The use of the law that is specific to you and I as Christians. You and me, you and I. Yeah, that one. How we as the sons of light, as Christians, are supposed to behave. Not to earn our salvation, but because we've already received our salvation that Jesus earned. Jesus is teaching us, how it is that we conduct ourselves in this generation, that is to say, in the world, on this side of the resurrection. He's reproving us, just as Proverbs 6.23 says, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the ways of life. Jesus is saying, you are Christian." You've received the light of the world, and while you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, he says, my gift to you is not permission to be lazy and unproductive. Don't think that. This is what Paul deals with, isn't it? In Romans, when he says, are we to to, uh, go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means is that to be the disposition of the Christian. No, uh uh-uh, nada. We are to live always in the light of Christ. If our neighbors can serve the devil in their unrepentant sin, our wicked, pagan, heathen neighbors, if they can serve the devil with such diligence, sparing no pains in their sinful treachery, well, then why shouldn't you and me as Christians, why shouldn't we want to serve our Lord in the same manner? to serve our Lord with with whom we share eternity. Or to put it in uh, more contemporary language, why should Team Satan outperform Team Jesus? See, Team Satan runs around like mad toward their eternal ruin and their destruction, breaking a sweat every single day, working on what they're working at. How can we be so indolent and lazy, dear saints? How? How are we not shaming our Lord, spitting in his face even, that while the others, the unrepentant, are rushing pell-mell toward hell, we can't even be bothered to crawl toward heaven in service to our neighbor. We can't even be bothered to think about crawling toward heaven in service to our neighbor. And indeed, here we also see then how this reading, this this dishonest manager parable delivers not only the third use of the law, but the second as well. Revealing and condemning our sin. We have both our Christian lamp and also the mirror of the law, don't we? that which shows us that we have much to repent of. If it depended on me, on Tyrell, to get to heaven, I'd never make it. Never. We understand this well, don't we, Christian? 
This is the very reason that Joe McColl and baby John were baptized today. This is the very reason every Christian is baptized, isn't it? Because we need to be connected to Christ's life, Christ's light, his industriousness. See, Jesus, he didn't let Team Satan outperform him. Mm-mm. No, Jesus ran circles around Team Satan's shrewdness. While the Sanhedrin plotted to kill him with great ingenuity and trickery under the, the cover of, of darkness with a double agent in their kangaroo court, while they were crafty in how they manipulated Pontius Pilate and clever in their, their commitment to earn hell, Jesus outfoxed the fox. <laughs> And he used their every move to defeat sin, death, and the devil. He outfoxed them. They played right into his hand and became the very human instruments our Lord used to secure your justification, my justification, by their cunning lawlessness. The great lawkeeper, Jesus Christ, delivered the gift of the gospel, not only earning the gift, the gift that he would give to you, that he has given to you, but masterfully using their hands to ratify the New Testament that he instituted in his blood, making the cup of blessing that we bless and the bread that we break forevermore the delivery system by which we receive his gift of forgiveness, salvation from the devil's chains, and eternal life with Jesus and our Father, and the Holy Spirit. By this gospel, this good news, we're set free to live, not as lazy bums, not indolent and unproductive and not indifferent, but more and more faithfully with each passing day that we're given on this planet, with more zeal for Christ today than we had yesterday, making our entire life about bringing the light of Jesus to other people. But make no mistake, dear saints. Jesus, he, he definitely wants you to try to serve him. He wants you to put in some effort. He doesn't delight in watching you squander your time and to waste your resources that he has given you to use to glorify his name so that other people, lost people, may be saved from their sin and even encourage those who are already saved, stirring them up in the faith. No, he doesn't delight in seeing you waste those things. He wants us to put in effort, not to save ourselves, but to be little Christ's. Him being the Christ who put in all the effort. And so we are like little Christs putting in some effort, but none for ourselves, all for our neighbor. So join me in repenting of sloth, repenting of laziness. Join me in that repentance and then striving to do better. Not for ourselves, not for yourself but for everybody else. Knowing that, that when we fail, you will fail, Jesus covers you with his pure white robe of grace and forgiveness. We need that grace and forgiveness, don't we? Absolutely we do. No doubt about it. And dear saint, be sure, in Christ you have it. Friend, you have received the grace of Christ, the free gift, it's yours. After all, you can only get to hell on your own. And Christ has promised that you're never on your own. His people are in your life to give you his word. That's what the whole church is about, that you're part of this community, you're part of this, this ecclesia, this assembly, this congregation. He's given you his spirit in baptism. And he gives you himself, his very body and blood in Holy Communion. No, you are not alone. You are far from on your own. God, he's with you. You 
are on Team Jesus. Amen. Friends, my prayer is that this sermon will be a blessing to you and yours. If you're looking for more faithful sermons from Ferndale, California, check out this playlist. Also, in the meantime, if you'd like to check out Cross Defense from KFUO Radio, the show that I host, we drop new episodes every Saturday right here at 9 a.m., and you can listen to back episodes on this playlist. Until next time, Christ be with you.